As Mike Bloomberg often says, if you can't measure something, you can't manage it. And that applies to companies and it applies to countries. And right now, the question of how we're managing the global economy is critically important. It's something we write about a lot at the Financial Times with our partners in Nikkei. And it's something which is becoming very, very important for policymakers. So we have a fantastic group of people to talk about it. Um, on my um, opposite me is Doug Peterson, who is President and Chief Executive Officer of S&P Global. Um, next to him is Mariana Mazzucata, who is Professor of Economics and also author of a book, The Value of Everything, mm -hmm. which is exactly about this question of what's wrong with GDP. And on my immediate left, your, your right, is Heizo Takeraka, who was former finance minister, economics minister in Japan, and is now professor at Keio University. Now, the issue of how we look at GDP is particularly relevant because this was basically a 20th century construct. Um, it was created to measure manufacturing, industrial processes that dominated the world in the 20th century. But we've moved on. We have digital world, we have you know, the environmental issues, things that really are starting to impinge. So, Doug, when you look at this issue, as someone who's not an economist, not a policymaker, but in the data business at S&P, what do you think about how we're using GDP today? Well, first of all, GDP is so critical for us as, as a CEO and as executive because we use it to make decisions about where we're going to invest. Mm. So when we're looking around the world where we want, where we want to invest, where we're going to put our, our new operations, we look to see where is their growth. So it, it has consequence for people like me to look at wh where we're going to be investing. When we talked earlier about the new economy, in the old economy, the old a GDP that you just described, not only was it built around a manufacturing economy, a farm-based economy, the way that information is gathered is still antiquated. Can you imagine how much information there is at Amazon and MasterCard and new ways to gather information? We can talk more about that. And then another part that's still antiquated <clears throat> is there's many activities that aren't picked up. You don't pick up informal activity, so you don't pick up cash-based activity, which in many economies is large. So the black market, the black, basically. Well, no, different. Not the black market. The, if you the go, gray market or? Mm, cash market. <laughs> Let's put it tax evasion. And then you've got another market. It's homework, people that work at home. And then you, then you have the illegal market. So there's parts of it. And some economies, that's up to 35% of GDP that's, that's missed. Wow. Mm -hmm. So the illegal market's an issue, or the gray market, and the informal market. Informal markets. The um, digital size an issue, and of course, environment too. But Mariana, you wrote an entire book about what's wrong with this. Give us a pricey. So, well, the book wasn't on GDP. It was actually on value. And of course, what underlies GDP is what we value. So if we're not valuing care, and care is often done for free in the home, then you know, it doesn't get measured. And that's a huge problem. In fact, if you marry your babysitter, GDP goes down. So don't do it. Because, you know, a, a service that was being paid for around care all of a sudden maybe is still being done, simply not being paid for. Anyway, there's lots of weird things like that in GDP. But I think what's interesting is we could actually squeeze so much more out of GDP even as it currently exists. So much you know, interesting things are being said around the world about what to add to it in terms of well-being and happiness. But even with its current state, you could you know, break down GDP in two different ways, either by income or um, by product. And if you look at you know, income, so profits, wages, rents, do we really understand the difference between profits and rents today? <laughs> you know, rents used to be called unearned income to the point that most of the financial sector up until 1970 wasn't even included in GDP because it was basically seen as a transfer, just like social security payments. When they did include it, investment banks, the idea was that they're risk taking, that's the service they're providing. Of course, when they went bust, who picked up the risk? The taxpayer, anyway. And, um, and uh, commercial banks, financial intermediation. But kind of breaking down what actually ended up happening with finance, you know, finance largely ended up financing itself, yeah. finance, insurance, and real estate. The extent to which we could also, you know, start breaking down, is it really creating value? Is it extracting value? Which bits are really creating value and differentiating that? But, um, you know, even just the other way to look at it would be in terms of demand, consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. A country like the UK is currently mainly growing through consumption, not investment. That consumption is being driven by private debt. So the ratio of private debt to disposable income is back at record levels. Mm -hmm. That you can see with just GDP as it stands without any happiness, but no one's talking about that. It wow. should be in the front pages of the Financial Times. 
Okay, that's well, we're going to we're gonna come back. That's and, what caused the crisis. We're going to come back in a moment and talk about what can be done to fix this. But the idea that, you know, once upon a time, Wall Street wasn't even measured in GDP um, might be taken as quite insulting for a lot of the big financial titans. But it also shows the type of problems there are and how statistics just don't keep up with changes in the economy. But um, Takanaka-sensei, I'd like to ask you, mm -hmm. you were in charge of the Japanese economy and trying to set policy using the statistics that you had available. How good were they? Did you trust them? Well, when I was uh, in the cabinet uh, uh, as a minister for economic fiscal policy, well, I was asked to rate GDP. You were asked well, to rate GDP? You know, I was asked by many people to rate GDP. However, uh, how reliable oh, right. GDP is. Of course, so we have a lot of problems uh, just mentioned by other people. However, it is very important to notice that uh, GDP has a relatively short history, mm. right? In 1929, we had the Great Depression. At that time, many people understand the importance of the, uh, we need some measure to uh, grasp the situation of the economy comprehensively. <laughs> At that time, in the 1930s and the 40s, uh, my excellent economists like uh, Simon Kuznets and some others, as you know, uh, created this system of national <laughs> account. And uh, since then, uh, the, we, the, so this has a GDP statistic that only 80 years history, just like the human being's lifespan. So during this short period, this had been you know, amended a lot. Still, we need, at this moment, more new type of <coughs> amendment. We live in a new economy. But, but in this case, we should understand uh, clearly what is a new economy? What is a new economy? We well, smart technology. <coughs> we live in the uh, fourth industrial revolution. So in this regard, first of all, later on, we'll discuss another aspect, the environment and the sustainability and the inclusiveness issues. But anyway, as far as smart technology age is concerned, well, Japan, Japanese government uh, changed the system the way of calculation of GDP four years ago. And uh, at that time, uh, Japan's GDP increased by 3.5%. Mm. To be specific, as you know, the R&D investment was also added mm. to mm. GDP. Mm -hmm. Before that, R&D investment was regarded just as an intermediate expense, yeah. expenditure, not a final expenditure. But maybe you understand, mm. R&D uh, investment is a very important investment to create yeah. the Stockholm knowledge. Yeah. So uh, since then, we are uh, paying very much uh, great attention on the importance of intangible, intangible asset. R&D is a very easy to understand, but various kind of intangible asset we have. So, but anyway, anyway, uh, so uh, the similar uh, change of calculation of GDP was uh, taken by Korea, Ireland, and these all countries, our GDP has increased a little bit. So, that's, so that's, it is very important to know the new, new, new uh, age, the post industrial revolution, the role of intangible asset. Well, you make a very good point there. And the case of Japan is very interesting <laughs> because not only do you have obviously an aging, shrinking population, and people often say, oh, the Japanese economy is in the doldrums because GDP has not been impressive. Um, but the fact you've brought in the investment into the equation is striking. Um, and the intangible issue is striking too. I mean, Doug, how do you think statisticians should be actually trying to capture the intangible element? Oh, absolutely. And when, when you think about some of the aspects of, of GDP, the measurement, one is the intangible. What's in, in some ways, it's almost thinking about utility as opposed mm -hmm. to a cash flow or what was measured that has a monetary value. Uh, another aspect is you're not measuring <coughs> depletion either. So it's because GDP is a, is a flow and not a stock, you could be creating a very strong GDP but depleting your mm. assets, depleting your, your well, some of the things we could talk about, ESG factors, where mm. you're depleting the environment and you're not picking that up. But on the intangible, let me give you an example of, of what we have today. If you think about when, when I was growing up, um, I had to go to the Encyclopedia Britannica to get information. Now I have this little computer in my pocket and I can get, I can get information at my fingertip and I don't, that's not measured at all in, in a GDP, the information, the substitution of how I get that value. And I don't, I'm not an expert in this, but I'm, I'm always asking the question, how do you measure utility and value created um, as opposed to something that is a cash flow or something that's measured 
in a, in a delivery of cash. One, one quick example, if, if I were using a travel agent to purchase a ticket, but now there's a new way I do it by, by using a website, that work didn't go away of booking a ticket. It's no longer being paid for at a travel agent, so GDP might have gone down. But the, mm -hmm. but the work created, the value created is still there. So I, this is something I'm, I'm trying to figure out. How do, you cr how do you capture value created and utility? So how do you? I mean, are there any countries? I mean, obviously, Japan has taken one step forward by including investment and trying to capture some of the intangibles. But are any countries doing this right? I mean, Mariana, you've been looking at these. Well, all the, all the countries that are run by women. <laughs> no, I hate to say, I just was writing, I was just thinking, it. New Zealand, Iceland, Scotland, yeah. Finland, hey, <laughs> correlation. Um, I mean, can I just say something, can we have a bit of time yeah. yeah, just sure. on the issues you mentioned are so crucial, but what you're talking about are drivers of long-term GDP growth. That already becomes another variable. Are we just talking about a little blip in GDP or long-term driver? And you mentioned Kuznets. Kuznets was so clear. He's like, oh, by the way, don't use this to you know, talk about 1.7, 1.78, yeah, 1.8%. Remind the GDP. audience what Kuznets. Oh, yeah. yeah. One yeah. of the founders yeah. of GDP, which, <laughs> yes. which yeah. he mentioned, exactly. Yes. But he warned. He said, you know, use it for kind of a mas o menos kind of a trend, but not kind of, you know, as though you're steering a car exactly where to go. And I think, you know, what's so interesting in Europe, for example, we look so much at the deficit or the debt. Yes. And as soon as you divide the debt by GDP, already it becomes more you know, refined. And so Italy, for example, is always accused that it's spending too much, but it hasn't. It, you know, its deficit has been, I don't know, 2 to 3%, often lower than Germany's. But debt to GDP, very high. Why? Because the long-run drivers of GDP, things like productivity, have not grown for almost 20 years in Italy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, we could actually, with existing measures, say a lot, but we don't talk about this in Europe. We just told Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, cut, 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 you're spending too much. And the other thing about R&D, you know, that as well, we don't really have an understanding of how to make sure that what we're spending on, at, in terms of public budgets, are in fact more steered towards these long-run drivers. So R&D is still, in many countries, just seen as a cost as opposed to you know, capital expenditure right. for long-run growth. And especially in software, right? Yeah. So software yeah. is definitely booked as a cost, but I think of software as, a, as almost like a capital investment, but it doesn't get treated like that. You see, this comes back to the point about if you can't measure it, you can't manage it properly. And this is leading potentially to big policy mistakes. Um, and I'm curious, in the case of Japan, because there was so much discussion about the lost decade of stagnant growth. Mm -hmm. Do you think people need to rethink their impression of the Japanese economy if mm. they have a different vision of the Japanese statistics? And I don't mean to pick on Japan, but you know, you are the policy okay. maker on the panel <laughs> and there's a lot of interest in this. Well, it's a very difficult issue because, mm. well, uh, many people uh, recognize the importance of GDP, of course, because uh, as I mentioned, it. Uh, it shows the very comprehensive economic activity. However, at the same time, some uh, factors should be added. Well, uh, one is an uh, intangible asset issue. Another one is an uh, environmental issue, for example. So we, we have been discussing this environmental issue for, many, for a long time, as you know, in, in 1970s. Already 1970s, we have our discussions. Well, uh, Economic Council of the Economic Planning Agency of the Japanese government established a new new idea of NMW, net national welfare. Net national welfare. In this case, so the environmental issue was considered into GDP. Uh, to be specific, uh, the uh, imputed cost of environment should be subtracted from GDP. As a result of that, at that time, GDP <coughs> was reduced by 2%. Mm. So some added, some should be reduced. So we, we have a lot of discussions on that. But still, still, important point is, uh, well, we should not depend too much on single indicator. Mm -hmm. GDP is a very important indicator. However, for example, please consider the, the, uh, my body condition. My weight, uh, height, and uh, body, uh, blood pressure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we could not depend on one single uh, indicator. But still, so a moderate amendment, moderate improvement of GDP, st GDP statics, statistics needed. But we should consider some other supplemental indicators. Um, not, at this moment, I think this is very important. So when you say, I mean, you made a very interesting point about the media, um, you know, that obviously the financial press and the markets tend to hang on mm 
these data releases. What do you think people should be talking about on a daily basis? I mean, what should we be putting on the front page of the Financial Times or the Nikkei or the Nikkei Asian Review? Our books. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, again, if we come back to what we know drives GDP growth, for example, we know that certain types of institutions are fundamentally important. And even just within Europe, we have very different types of institutions, for example, that link or don't link science and industry. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind of uh, um, Fraunhofer institutes, for example, in yeah. Germany, they don't necessarily exist in other parts of Europe. And if we think that they're important for having that kind of productivity uh, growth or vocational training, education, R&D kind of spending, then we would be looking on our dashboard in terms of the health of a country, those kind of indicators, as well as, of course, a more refined analysis recently around well-being of the um, nation and different types of right. happiness indicators. But then you could argue that then Europe, for example, when it's giving out bailouts to countries that are having problems, instead of having these conditions that are also just about one number, you know, reduce your deficit. So the IMF conditions or the exactly. ECB numbers yeah. saying that you have to do X, Y, and Z <laughs> based on debt to GDP or deficit. Yeah. If they want that country to become more competitive, they could actually also be giving more refined advice not just reduce your deficit, but hey, you really need to start building these institutions, which we know through evidence base are quite important. But again, that's more of a dashboard uh, understanding of competitiveness and health of an economy. Right. And these are really profound policy issues which you were grappling with when you were in office. But can I turn to another question, which is, is there any way to change how we collect data? Because I find it just astonishing that we have these tech giants who have the tools to know what we had for lunch before we even eat it, who can track everything we do all the time and are selling the data to each other and or the whole data brokerage industry, and yet we have to wait for an entire month or sometimes a lot longer to get GDP statistics. Is there a better way to start actually collecting data about the economy? Did you ever try and ask, ask any of your <laughs> tech companies to help you? Well, a uh, big data issue. It's, uh, of course, very important. Uh, last year, Prime Minister Abe appeared here, and he made an excellent speech uh, focusing the importance of the data free flow with trust. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is a, a very important topic that has been discussed in this Davos meeting. Uh, but still, still, for example, we have big data. Data is important at the same time. Well, uh, in in, in order to calculate GDP, various kind of indicators are needed. So uh, you mentioned, well, uh, what we, we watch, what, what kind of statistics we watch. GDP is very important. GDP appears only uh, every quarter, only every quarter, once a three months, once a three months. So still it's very limited. So, well, this is still very important. At the same time, we need much more frequent uh, statistics mm. did it. Mm. Well, of course, economists have been uh, discussing, as you know, uh, open statistics or open coefficient like that. For this is a, well, very frequent GDP uh, fluctuation should be reflected in the rate of unemployment, etc., etc. So in that sense, well, uh, the policy makers, policy analysts are watching this kind of uh, statistics. So in that sense, I'd like to say some kind of dashboard type of indicator. Mm. Dashboard type of indicator is needed. For example, uh, World Economic Forum issued the uh, competitiveness ranking. They are combining several, <coughs> well, 50 or 56 degree indicators. Mm -hmm. So the combination, combining these statistics is very important from the viewpoint right. of policymakers. I mean, because S&P um, is in fact scraping data, aren't you? All the you? time. I mean, in trade, I know you've got some extraordinary activities happening. Yes, yeah, so in the trade area, we have now, uh, we've got <laughs> access to almost every port and airport in the world. For, and we extract that data daily unless the, that port or airport doesn't have it. And then we put it into a database and we can see, we will know sometimes that Apple has changed the battery they're using or the lens is using before the markets do because we can see the shipments that are going around the world. So my, my answer to your question is absolutely you could be using new data techniques, uh, machine learning, uh, alternative ways to gather data. An example that's happening right now, every 10 years the United States does a census. And this year, the census is going to go out, and they're going to do it in a way that's electronic. And you can do it on your computer using the internet. You can use it on your phone. You can do it in paper. Mm -hmm. And they only expect that about 65% of the people are going to do one of those three, which means there's still going to be 35% of the people that they're going to have to go hire 
300 to 600,000 people <laughs> as part-time workers to go finish the census. So they're in the, the Department of Commerce in the U.S. is attempting this new approach using the phone and the internet. And uh, I do think that it's a good step that they're trying mm -hmm. something new about gathering fundamental data. But there's so many more ways you could do it. But the key word is fundamental data, and that's different from the speed, you know, how quickly yeah, you get yeah, the data. Yeah. You could also argue that we have information overload. Do you really need to know GDP figures every kind of five seconds? And in fact, you know, getting more refined analysis precisely around the digital economy. There's this great um, book out called um, Surveillance Capitalism and mm. this notion of the behavioral surplus. This book by Shoshana Zuboff. She says that the re you know people think they're searching Google for free, but actually Google is searching you for free. <laughs> <laughs> and so this whole, again, difference between value creation, value extraction, can we actually start using different types of measures that really tell us the way that we're using the power of the algorithms and new technologies in ways that really contribute to a healthier more um, productive capacity in our economy versus a more extractive one. Yes. Well, may I raise uh, another important aspect of statistics? Of course, uh, GDP, our uh, debt GDP ratio, this is very important. <laughs> it's also very important to get a quick information about from the, uh, the, uh, from the data. At the same time, by analyzing these indicators, we can understand very clearly the strengths and uh, the weakness of this company, with its economy. For example, in the case of the uh, United Kingdom, for example, investment is high or low, consumption high or low, and so on. Mm -hmm. So in this regard, for example, I, I would go back to the uh, intangible investment, intangible asset. Well, in the case of Japan, intangible investment GDP ratio is about 9%. 9%. This is are, uh, uh, clearly lower than that of the United States. In the case of the United States, 15% or so maybe. But the contents of the intangible investment is more, more important issue for Japan, for example. Right. While well, R&D investment, Japanese businesses uh, have been investing for this R&D relatively high. This R&D investment GDP ratio in Japan is not relatively high. However, uh, some another kind of uh, intangible investment especially human resource investment mm -hmm. and the expenditures on organization reform. This is very weak in Japan. Mm -hmm. So by analyzing this intangible asset or intangible investment, well, we can understand the weakness and the strengths of the economy company. This kind of function is very important uh, to make use of this kind of statistics. This is another important aspect <coughs> of statistics. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm aware that there are a lot of people in the room who are experts in this field and have got a lot to say. So. I'm going to turn to the audience for questions in just a moment, but before I do, and do start preparing your questions, before I do, um, Mariana, can you give us, go back to some of the examples you see which are actually encouraging amongst the countries in dealing with this issue? Because, you know, obviously a lot of the economic reporting in the world tends to be dominated by Europe, the Eurozone, mm -hmm. America, Japan, big countries. Are there case studies of countries which are being creative and actually doing the kind of things you're talking about? Well, I think what's interesting is the, <laughs> the conversation's changing from just the measures to, well, what are we even trying to do? So if we have the Sustainable Development Goals, which were signed up to by hundreds of countries, what does that then mean for the value, the kind of economies that we're trying to create? And what's interesting is that at the microeconomic level, that conversation is really having impact on the metrics, right? You know, whether it's ESG or better types of metrics within companies and whether they're really reaching these targets around the environment or different types of social factors. And I think what's interesting is can we then link that conversation, which is about governance of organizations in business and other, to given that then we do aggregate up statistics about companies also to get parts of the figures for GDP, what does that then look like at the macroeconomic level? And, and yet the conversations about the environment, for example, <coughs> in GDP is not linked up to that governance of the microeconomic unit. Absolutely, um, yeah. And currently, I do think, I mean, I, I'm not the only one who thinks so, that there is a bit of a washing, you know, in, in terms of talking a lot about the environment. And then if you look again at the figures of what's actually happening in finance, you know, the top three asset management companies, BlackRock, Vanguard, and uh, another one that I can't remember its name, have actually increased their spending on fossil uh, fuel-based companies by 35% since Paris, um, since COPs in 2015. So, you know, the talk, turning it into a walk, will be much easier when these metrics, first of all, are mandatory, but also when 
the kind of micro and the macro really are more lined up. I mean, Doug, you're trying to bring in these green factors into credit ratings, aren't you? And you're trying, really, for the first time to systematically look <coughs> at in these um, non-traditional economic metrics when you look at companies. Can that be extended to countries as well? Well, I think so, and I think, but to your point, starting at the, at the micro level, so to call it, the corporate level is going to be important because that will drive behavior. Okay. If we start measuring companies, we have more standardized approach to measuring E, S, and G factors. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the S is hard to get. There's not a lot out there. The social factors, mm -hmm. it's not really very well defined. The, the governance has been around a long time, and on the, on the environmental factors, it's not consistent. It's hard to get the information. At the, so at the corporate level right now, if we want to get the data, and we're, we're actually gathering ourselves, it's, it's self-reported, it's not audited, it's not consistent, people don't measure it the same way. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the really valuable discussions that we've been having this week in Davos is exactly around mm -hmm. that question. Yeah. Um, in the International Business Council of WEF the last few days, uh, Brian Moynihan <laughs> led a, a group of people that came up with a, a draft of uh, some pilot uh, questions and pilot statistics that we would endorse that all corporations would start putting together. So I think that we can start driving at a corporate level, a micro level, and have the same dialogue as well at the, right. the national level. And Takanaka Sensei, I see you're wearing a wonderful green tie, <laughs> which is <laughs> indicating yes. where the world's going, so well chosen. Green GDP, yes. Exactly, green GDP. <laughs> so tell us, before we turn to questions, you know, do you see areas where Japan could try and do more to measure the impact on the environment? Okay. Or rather the other way around, the externalities? OK, I said, I use the term, we live in this sustainable and inclusive society. In that sense, we should consider other factors other than the GDP or the income. Uh, for example, for example, the environmental issue is a very important issue. This is now have been discussed for long, uh, for a long period, and we now have some uh, indicators to show the uh, imputed cost of environment. And additionally, uh, what the income gap, income gap, income equality, this also should be considered. And at the same time, nowadays in Japan, uh, most attention-grabbing discussion is people's health, health mm -hmm. condition. While well, Japan has the uh, longest life span of people in the world, this is not reflected in GDP, for example. So while well, uh, Ministry of Economy, Trade, Industry is uh, commending, commending some excellent companies for uh, health management, etc., etc. So th th this should be are uh, considered very seriously from <laughs> here on. We are, are moving toward the aging society, aging demography. Uh, so, well, this would be, uh, have a good uh, impact, strong impact on the medical cost, et cetera, et cetera. So, well, in my impression, security and uh, health and uh, environment, uh, these are uh, very, very attention-grabbing issue in my right. Can I make a comment yeah, about this? Yeah, um, Japan is actually an example of a developed country in this theme of environmental impact. It's actually much more positive than any others. The mm. energy usage of a, of a per GDP or per capita in Japan is about 60% of the U.S. It's, a, it's about 80% of Europe. And it's partially because of city design, urban design. Yep. It's mass use of mass, trans of, of mass transit. It's, it's, the, it's the subway systems. It's the trains. People live in smaller homes. And so there's a whole footprint, an environmental footprint, that as we start thinking about other solutions to smart cities and, and environmentally friendly cities, some places we can look to already or, or we can see practiced in Japan. Well, that's fascinating. Of course, one of the whole points about the forum um, and Davos is to try and get that sort of international learnings from each other. But on that note, let's have some comments from the audience. I know there are a number of you who'd like to speak. Let me quickly see. I can see hands going up already. Um, Let's start with you. Um, it would be courteous but not compulsory to identify yourself. And since we have a number of hands already, please keep any comments or questions very short. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, my name is Abby. I'm a global shaper from London and also the CEO of an early stage tech company. Thank you very much for the panel. My question is mainly for Mariana, but please feel free to input. There is a very dominant narrative in Silicon Valley that government and the public sector is mainly a hindrance, which of course is not true. It would be great if you could maybe share some of your research and findings on how public spending, government spending, has in fact been critical to commercializing many of the technologies that we use today. Thank you very much. So how does statistics show that government is good? So the phone that your friend there has. 
<laughs> is it a smartphone or a stupid phone? Is a dumb phone not? Well, everything that makes her a smartphone, I'm sure it's smart. It has a little Apple thing on it. Um, is, and, and not stupid, was in fact invested by public institutions, right? So internet, Siri, touchscreen display, um, GPS. Now, what's interesting, though, is that, again, when these are publicly financed institutions, we also don't really have a narrative to talk about this. So in economics, it's not just the value debate that is so interesting, but the way we think of policy is just correcting something. So we talk about it as correcting a market failure. But actually, what public institutions did in Silicon Valley was you know, really co-create and co-shape that market. And I think this really comes back to this issue of narrative. I mean, GDP isn't just a number. There's narratives around it, both in terms of how we talk about it in the media, but where we think wealth creation comes from, how it can be that, I think it was um, Lloyd Blank Stein, or Stein, the head of uh, a Goldman Sachs said in 2009, Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world. And then they were bailed out by, what, over 10 billion by the US taxpayer. You didn't hear the US taxpayer saying, we're the most productive in the world. Right? And a school teacher doesn't say we're the most productive in the world because, in fact, with public education, when it's free, we only know how to measure the costs, the salaries, not the output. We're still not yeah. good at even measuring something as obvious as the value that, publicly education, um, that a public education system provides. So we literally can't even account for the productivity because we don't have a price for the output. But the big thing about the public sector is that, of course, we need it. But it's not just about kind of wartime, Cold War kinds of technological spending. Coming mm -hmm. back to the SDGs, this notion that we really should have mission-oriented kind of spending with real kind of public sector guidance of big directional pushes, and then crowding in bottom-up experimentation also by the business community, or mainly, to solve these big public goals. That's a very different way to structure public-private partnership. And I would argue that what we need in WEF is to really also have metrics of how to define an interesting, dynamic, symbiotic public-private partnership going for a goal versus the kind of parasitic predator-prey kind of public-private partnerships we have, for example, in the health sector. Wow. That's very good. <laughs> good point. Um, right, question here, and then another one next to you, and then we'll come around this way. Uh, thanks very much. I'm uh, Jonathan Haskell from Imperial College. Um, I, I'm going to risk unpopularity by defending G G GDP, if I may, just for a second. Uh, and if we just think back to what it is when we teach G GDP to the students, sorry, I'm an economist. Um, you don't need to apologise for being an economist. I think you're in the majority in the room, probably. <laughs> <laughs> we give them the basic intuition, which I think is worth remembering, which is that if we've got an economy which is producing steel and producing cars, the one thing we mustn't do is add the steel and the cars, because, mm. of course, the steel goes into the cars as an intermediate input. So part of the reason why GDP is rather complicated and part of the reason why, as you were saying, you know, Gillian, it's a bit frustrating. You know, surely these big tech companies have got lots of information is they might have information on the various goods, but that's not good enough. What we need is we need the information mm. to compute the value added on all the various intermediate chains. Right. If I could make, make that one point. Mm. If I could make a second point briefly, if I may, yeah. which is in the case of steel and cars, we know what an intermediate input is, the steel <coughs> that's used up into the cars. As Professor Ta Takanaka rightly points out, when we've got intangible inputs like R&D and software, we don't quite know how to deal with those. Now, at that point, it seems to me, I just want to correct a misapprehension. The national accountants who do GDP have been very energetic in attempting to capitalize intangibles. It's the company accountants yeah. who refuse to count up intangibles. Yeah, yeah. So actually, <laughs> <laughs> throw Okay, so it's yeah. all your <laughs> fault, Doug. No, yeah. all right. We're going to throw rotten tomatoes at, 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 at GDP. Can we just keep in mind that, that it's got that basic mm -hmm. intuition, which is very very helpful and that there has been a bit of progress. More to do, but there has been some progress. Those are great points. Mm -hmm. And before we have a response, mm -hmm. I'm going to take the next question as well, because those are indeed very good points. Yeah. And then I'm going to ask Doug to defend corporate accountants. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm Eric Brignol, I'm a professor at MIT, and, and I very much want to build on, on Jonathan's uh, comments. He's much too modest. We certainly have a lot of academic yeah. pros yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I'm going to support his, his, his view because what, he's too modest. He actually was the person who's done so much work mm -hmm. to bring intangibles into, into the national accounting. And, and, and like him, yeah. I, I see a lot of virtues with GDP, a lot, a lot of problems. But there is a, a, a massive irony in the information age, which is mm. that we have less and less information about where real value comes from. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily because GDP is, is flawed. I mean, it, it was a 20th, 20th century construct, great at counting uh, numbers of cars produced or bushels of wheat. It's really not designed for a digital age where so many of the things we get on our smartphones, as Mariana mm -hmm. pointed out, are free. The, you know, the maps or the music or the, the Wikipedia. Anything that has a price of zero gets a weight of 
zero <laughs> in GDP. Does that mean it has zero value? No. But that's actually what GDP was designed to do. And it's not a matter of us changing GDP to fix that. Simon Kuznets, as Marianne pointed out, um, made, made a number of interesting points. One of them was that do not use GDP as a welfare measure, a well-being mm -hmm. measure. But with the exception of the people here, that's what a lot of journalists Absolutely. and policy makers and economists mm -hmm. are doing. What we need is, as was, was mentioned, is a dashboard approach. Mm -hmm. GDP is a measure of production. Let's keep it as a measure, measure of production. Yes. Yes. We, what we're interested in, well-being, we need a measure of well-being. That mm. is a, con a fundamentally different concept. Mm -hmm. That's how much benefit you get from each thing. So if you pay zero for Wikipedia, but you get $100 worth of benefit, that's what we want to measure. And we have a new measure called GDPB, the B for benefit, that can be parallel to GDP, that captures those benefits. And it uses some of the power of the digital age because we right. can do hundreds of thousands actually millions now of online choice experiments to assess how much people need to be paid to give up different, different goods. And ultimately, mm -hmm. we will, by this time next year, have a parallel set of numbers, of GDPB, that focus on the benefits to go along with the production cost GDP. And I think then we'll ha have a piece of the dashboard that Tanaka-san and Mariana <coughs> and Doug have all been talking about. That's fascinating. Well, that's, that, I'm going to keep going around because those are two great con contributions to, to the discussion. Um, I think one of the subtexts is, if you want to understand this, read Mariana's book and, and click on to GDPP. And Jonathan's book. And Jonathan's book as well. Sorry, Jonathan's book as well. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, thank you, Mariana. And, um, and then you get a good picture of it. But we had a couple of hands waving over here as well, and I want to try and, for fairness, get one person behind me. <laughs> we haven't got much time left, so if you can be short. Thank you. I'm Pierre Habar. I'm with the Trade Union Advisory Committee to the OECD, so not an academist, not an economist, a union guy. Uh, I, but one question was precisely, isn't it an irony that we need more access to data to fine-tune uh, our measurement, but uh, uh, as we can see, I can witness it in the discussion at the OECD, that there is precisely less and less information because we are facing a kind of privatization of, uh, uh, of, uh, of a data with more proprietary and, and a very very broad understanding of what business confidentiality uh, is. So a question is, it's, you know, where do we put the spectrum between perhaps legitimate business confidentiality requirements and uh, the need for more granular mm -hmm. and, and, and in the end access uh, to data? If I may, a second mm. question is, I understand the idea of a dashboard having uh, multiple indicators, but from a political economy perspective, what often happens <coughs> is that decision makers, they need one indicator, not one, uh, not mm -hmm. two, three, four. So yeah. the question is, should we move toward a dashboard or should we actually replace GDP? <laughs> With a composite, right. I'm going to take one last question and then we're going to let you each respond. Because um, I do want to be fair to the room. Make sure I get both right and left. I feel like I'm doing a disservice to your neck muscles, Jimmy. No, no, no. So, John Alexander, I'm more a sort of social scientist than an economist. Uh, it, well, that side, of the, the softer <laughs> side of social science, should we say. Um, I, I'm very interested in this thing about um, measures as carriers of narrative, and, and particularly with GDP, that what, what seems to happen with, is that as a sole measure is it then drives what all the other measures that are talked about are. And so one of the things I'm particularly interested in is on the news, what you see reported, the, the public face then becomes particularly the consumer confidence index is, is something that gets, seems to get a disproportionate level of cover. Mm. When, in a world where we are not just consumers, and, and we're actually the, the identity construct of a consumer has there's a fairly, fairly good set, set of evidence that a it's restrictive and and maybe prioritises consumption as a strategy for, for governments, but also mm. that people primed as consumers tend to care less about the environment and one another. I'm interested in whether that whether there's a feeling that that things like consumer confidence ought to be a focus of more conversation rather than just GDP. Whether right. that, that sort of narrative function should be more of the discussion. So, narrative economics. Okay, well, I think we have my, my, my calculation. You have about a minute and a half each to deal with those massive oh, right. existential questions. Doug, do you want to defend yes. corporate accountants and private well, data? What I, will, what I will defend is, first of all, to start off, I do think GDP is still critical. We have a time series. It's been around a long time. And it is the foundation of so many decisions. And it's also used by political world, the financial world. And the question we had here today is, how, we can, how can we make it better? And I think we've heard that the second point I want to make is that there is a massive amount of data available to make it better. 
or to find new measurements, whether it's how we think about uh, well-being, how we think about the education system, how we think about the healthcare system. And I will tell you in our own case, both in the ratings business, our index business, et cetera, we incorporate that kind of information into choosing and making a decision about rating or choosing assets which be included in the index. It's not just a simple GDP metric. And then finally, um, we're in a world where data is now massive. It's everywhere. And Every single organization is either struggling with or embracing a data strategy. And I think as part of our discussion here, everybody has to have a data strategy and how they're going to use new machine learning, new approaches to man managing large, vol vo large volume of data. And we need to incorporate that back into how we think about GDP. Right. Mariana. So that question, which was fantastic, as actually all the questions were, it really is about the ownership and the governance of the data and who it benefits. And you know, personalized uh, medicine has created all sorts of uh, uh, data or is benefiting from big data in ways that, for example, the welfare state hasn't yet. Um, and that's one of the biggest questions. How can we actually reinvent the welfare state instead of decimating it as has been happening in, in, in many countries and really allow it, for example, what they're doing in Barcelona, every time you, you click on city mapper, you're generating data, right? Data isn't static, it's being generated now with people on their phones. And they've been thinking about the new kinds of institutions they actually need. For example, a public repository of the data, which, you know, that would come from citizens engaging with phones across right. the city, which then would benefit immediately public transport um, and the transport infrastructure and ideas about mobility, but really kind of benefiting citizens. But that just requires a whole other conversation, which is about democracy and, again, the commons and the data commons. And it, it's just that we shouldn't assume that because there's so much data out there and we just need to get access to it, it's going to be good. Right. And these questions of ownership and governance right. are key. Just one quick thing on consumption, just in case it wasn't clear. It's not a good thing when you're growing just by buying things, especially if wages haven't been <laughs> uh, rising. That mean, I mean, what's been happening in the UK, and you can see this in the GDP data. That's why I would defend GDP on so many levels. We're just not using it for that. What you can see in the UK is that private debt to disposable income is back at record levels. That is what caused the crisis. The FT, but no other paper is talking about it. And you actually can see that with the GDP data. It's consumption-led growth private, uh, fueled by private debt. And that's right. the problem. That's what causes bubbles to burst. OK, uh, let me focus on the one point, dashboard or GDP. Well, it's a very challenging question. But my, my, my personal proposal is the moderate uh, amendment of GDP is needed, especially considering uh, the importance of uh, intangible asset. But I, I, my, my policy suggestion is uh, sometimes uh, criticized as too radical, but I, I do not recommend radical um, amendment of GDP this time. For the reason is, uh, but still, you understand quite well, uh, we have so many difficulties in measuring intangible asset. For example, for example, well, how can you get the real value? Real value, nominal value, real value. Well, it's, 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 it's a very tough task. But so well, we should consider the environmental issue, and also we should consider uh, intangible asset, but some moderate uh, amendment is needed. At the same time, well, dashboard uh, type of indicator, we should right. focus more. Uh, so, uh, well, well, so GDP or dashboard, this is the, the both are needed. That my recommendation is very moderate, uh, steady uh, amendment of GDP is uh, needed. And uh, this kind of effort has been uh, accumulated by many economists here. Right. And also, finally, dashboard type of indicator, we should focus more from here on. Right. Well, thank you. Well, I must say, I find this a fascinating discussion. Thank you to all three of you and also the audience. And I take away sort of three main points. You know, one is that clearly there are big challenges right now about how we look at the world around us and measure it. Measure it. And this has big policy implications. What is encouraging is that there is now a debate and recognition. Um, what's perhaps even more encouraging is that groups like the World Economic Forum are trying to bring people together to talk about this. Um, but it's not going to be easy to fix and e easy to come to any kind of new path. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. So on that note, I'd like to finish by asking Zadia Sahidi, um, who's a managing director of the World Economic Forum, <laughs> to talk about what you're doing on this front um, and bring this discussion, fascinating, fascinating discussion, to a close. So give us the answers. Oh, well, <laughs>
have um, for, it's, you know, you know you're at the 50th anniversary, but 40 years ago, we, our founder started the Global Competitiveness <laughs> Report, um, which was a novel idea that let's take a look at the factors that feed into medium to long-term productivity and looked at human capital, looked at the institutions, et cetera. Along the way, we've added things like our global gender gap index. We've added just earlier this week, our social mobility index, looking at human capital and the future of jobs. And the idea now is, inspired by the work we've been able to do in the last six months with our International Business Council on having some convergence around ESG metrics, could we try to help create that dashboard around GDP? So today's conversation has been fascinating. For anybody who would like to be involved in that effort over this coming year, please do talk to me or my team that is here. Thank you so much. So watch this space. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.